Greetings, my friends. It's good to be with you after such a long time. As you can probably guess, I'm speaking to you from home and I'm grateful to Greg and to others who have made this technological miracle possible. I know it's a lot of uh, extra work and I am very grateful. Like you at the moment, my prayers are with all of those who are battling this COVID-19 epidemic or pandemic, isn't it? And I'm praying for the people in Victoria and New South Wales and of course for ourselves in the hope that the spread in Queensland won't be as bad as it is beginning to look. So let us pray. May my words and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Well, during my life, I've met people who have accrued a great deal of wealth, who seem to have climbed the ladder of success, who are admired by many people. But I look at them and I sometimes wonder, well, just how ethical are these people? They seem ruthless. And sometimes I wonder how honest they really are. And I wonder, is this all really fair? Now, I wonder too, if you've met people like this, of course, not, not in this room, not amongst this company, but I wonder, have you met people like this? It seems to me that Jacob, whom we meet in the Old Testament reading this morning, is one of these people. Jacob could be described as a thief. He is certainly self-centered. He's a con man and he's a liar. But Jacob became the third of the great patriarchs of the nation of Israel. And what I see when I look at the story of Jacob is that I see that God works with Jacob. He works with Jacob as Jacob is, so that the divine plan is able to go forward. The story of Jacob reminds me that God is big enough to work with this man. We only have a small part of the story of Jacob as the reading today. We meet Jacob on the riverbank. He's alone and he's returning home. He's certainly a wealthy man. He's returning home after 20 years away. And he's somewhat uneasy about this return. He doesn't know how it will all go with his brother Esau. And he's right to be uneasy because 20 years ago and more, he stole Esau's birthright. He and Esau are twin brothers, but Esau was born first. And it was his right to inherit from the father Isaac. He would inherit all Isaac's wealth. He would inherit his right to leadership, his judicial authority, and his place in the covenant with God that had first been made with Abraham then passed to Isaac and then should have passed to Esau. But when they were adolescents, 
Jacob had tricked Esau. Esau had come home from hunting venison, declaring, I'm starving, give me a bowl of stew. And Jacob had said, I'll give you a bowl of stew if you give me your birthright. <laughs> okay, says Esau. A rather silly sort of adolescent prank, I'd imagine. But Jacob is determined to hold him to it. When it is time to formalise the birthright in a blessing ceremony, Jacob's mother colludes with him. And she sends Jacob in to Isaac, dressed in Esau's clothing, with lambskin covering his arms, so that when Isaac, who is now almost blind, reaches out to touch his favourite son, he will be tricked into thinking that this is in fact Esau. When Esau returns home from his latest hunting trip, he is incandescent with rage and declares that he will kill his brother Jacob. Jacob's mother arranges for Jacob to flee to her kinsman Laban. And Laban turns out to be just as tricky and just as much a con man as Jacob himself. And through a series of trickery and deceit and lies, Laban and Jacob contest with each other. But Jacob manages to accrue all the wealth that he brings with him 20 years later on his return journey. Jacob has divided up his wealth. Half of it is hidden away so that if the return goes pear-shaped, he has enough to start again. Then he sends his wife, his wives, two of them, and his 11 children to meet Esau, who's coming with 400 men. He hopes to blunt Esau's anger, if indeed Esau is angry, by sending the women and the children with gifts. While Jacob is waiting, to find the outcome of this latest scheme, a man appears and begins to wrestle with him. Now the question has long been, who is this man? Is it Esau? Is it Jacob's guilty conscience? Or is it his demons? I don't think Jacob has yet developed a conscience, and I don't really think it's his demons. I tend to think it's the other suggestion, that it is in fact God who comes to wrestle with Jacob. Often in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord appears as a man. And the angel of the Lord is synonymous with God. Jacob is at his grasping best in this scene. He grabs hold of the man, demands a blessing. What Jacob wants, Jacob will have. And he hangs on, absolutely determined to have what he wants. He calls what he wants a blessing and he will not let go. The man in desperation grabs hold of Jacob's hip and he wrenches the hip bone out of the socket. But Jacob still does not let go. Such is his determination. What is your name? The man asks, Jacob, not any longer. From now on, you will be called Israel because you have striven 
with God and man and you have prevailed. And of course, this is the theological difficulty. Can a human prevail against God? Perhaps in this instance, God is prepared to allow that to happen in order to keep Jacob on the side God is prepared to allow that to happen to allow Jacob to believe that he has indeed prevailed against God but when Jacob gets up in the morning to continue his journey towards Esau he limps and no doubt he is in pain. He will limp and he will have pain for the rest of his life. He will always have this reminder of the encounter with the divine. He will not be able to put it aside or leave it behind. So perhaps in the end, it was God who prevailed with Jacob. This story, I think, opens my eyes to just how big God actually is and how God is able to provide room for all sorts of characters and all sorts of personalities. How God is able to work with all people on, their, on terms that make sense to those people. God didn't wait until Jacob had been transformed or until Jacob had reformed. He works with Jacob as Jacob is. He doesn't punish Jacob. He doesn't banish him. And he doesn't annihilate him. Although I would imagine all those three possibilities were open to God. He challenges Jacob in terms that made sense to Jacob. And Jacob met those challenges. It is probably only much later in Jacob's life that he comes to realize just what the cost is of that blessing that he stole so long ago from his brother Esau. I think this story reminds me that we cannot tame God. We cannot domesticate God. We cannot put God into a box and keep God there. God will always remain much larger, bigger and greater than anything I can ever imagine. That there is in God a determination to carry out the divine plan. And that in carrying out the divine plan, God is wily and at some times God is dangerous. And some of these great characters in the Old Testament story demonstrate that to us. Amen.